Francis Fukuyama, globalna zvijezda među intelektualcima, jedan od vodećih društvenih teoretičara našeg doba, američki republikanac koji je kreirao politike Vašingtona, gost je emisije Prva intervju. Svjetski poznat analitičar, autor bestsellera Kraj istorije i posljednji čovjek u Crnoj Gori je učestvovao u radu prestižne liderske akademije za razvoj, čiji su organizatori, ekonomski fakultet i Centar za demokratsku tranziciju. Za prvu govori o političkim i društvenim izazovima u Evropi i svijetu. Poštovani gledalci, dobroveče, pratite prva intervju. Vidjeli ste ko je naš večerašnji gost. Na razgovor idemo odmah nakon reklama. So, Mr. Fukuyama, welcome to Montenegro and thank you for this interview. Thank you for having me. It has been 30 years since you announced the end of history. That announcement was all about your famous conclusion that with liberal democracy we all reach that the best possible organization of the human society. Did we really? Because, for example, communists said that that was communism. Well, that's exactly the point I was making. The idea of the end of history was implicit in Marxism. So. The Marxists said that history was progressive, and at the end of that progression was communism. And my observation back in 1989 was we weren't going to get there, uh, that communism was a failure, and that if there was an end of history, it was going to be in the stage prior to communism, which was some form of what the Marxists called bourgeois democracy coupled with a capitalist uh, economy. And I think that's still the case. I don't really see a higher form of civilization. I don't think that, you know, an Islamic Republic or China represents the future, that we're all going to somehow evolve into those kinds of societies. Uh, the mixture of nationalism and populism exploded in the Balkans several times. Yes. Uh, should Europe be afraid of the Balkan experience, knowing that, that uh, right-wing parties are uh, getting stronger? Well, I think that's the real danger in Europe right now is that you've got these populist movements like the Alternative for Germany or the National Front in France uh, that are identity-based parties. That is to say, they're based on a certain ethnicity and they, you know, they want a kind of uniformity in their societies. And that's something that goes against the liberal traditions that I think have been you know, very strong in Western Europe uh, all this time. I think Eastern Europe and the former communist world was different because it seemed like it had adopted liberal democracy back in 1989 or 91 or you know, the moment of transition. But in fact, some of the liberal values, that is to say the tolerance you know, for diversity really never took root. And that's, you know, I think, the disease right now that's afflicting you know, a lot of Europe. Yeah, it seems that people rather uh, choose that right wing parties. Uh, so what do you think? Why that uh, political energy went right? Well, there's a couple of things. So you had a kind of globalization that erased borders economically. Uh, you had huge movements of people. So in many, um, well, many uh, Eastern European countries have lost, you know, 15, 20 percent of their population. And a lot of countries in Western Europe have gained uh, very large numbers of foreigners. And I think this becomes culturally very uh, threatening to many people who see their societies changing. There's also been a lot of inequality because of outsourcing and you know, competition from low labor cost areas you know, have decimated uh, a lot of industrial areas in you know, the older democracies. So all of this, I think, has contributed to a sense of unease among a lot of the populations there, and th those are the people that end up voting for populist parties. And what do you think, for how long this right-wing trend is going to last? You know, that's impossible to predict. I think um, part of the problem for them is that they're not very good at governing. So I think if Britain crashes out of the European Union, it's going to be an economic disaster for that country, and it's not going to make the authors of Brexit you know, very popular. Um, 
Same thing is true in Hungary. I think Hungary has actually been very badly governed under Viktor Orban, but the European Union in a way is propping him up through the subsidies that Hungary gets, which are equal to 5% of GDP. And so he doesn't actually have to perform that well because of the help that he gets from the EU. Uh, so I think that you know, in the long run, the populists don't really have a formula for success, for prosperity, for stability, or really for any of the things that we want out of a modern political order. You mentioned Brexit. What do you think about Brexit? I think that uh, it was a big mistake. Uh, I think if they held another referendum, it would not pass because as you've gotten closer to it, I think people realize that economically this is going to lead to a big disaster. And that's one of the reasons why no other country in Europe is talking about leaving the European Union now. Uh, can the left wing wake up and how? Well, it is waking up in a certain sense. I, I think that a lot of people in reaction to the populace are realizing that they value their, you know, their democracy and that they've let uh, inequality get too far out of the way. It's just that many traditional social democratic parties are now being pushed aside by Green parties, for example. Uh, in the European elections, you know, I think this was very clear that this is a trend. The agenda of the left has been shifting also so that environment, for example, has become much more important than the kind of traditional support for the working class that used to be the core of the left-wing agenda in the 20th century. Uh, you said that you do not consider Donald Trump a populist. Uh, still, we can all remember all uh, his campaign and mm -hmm. uh, uh, his promises such as uh, closing borders. Oh, no, he's, he's a definitely a populist. No, there's no question. He's, um, uh, I don't think he's much of a believer in democracy you know, or in liberal democracy. Um, it's very unusual uh, to have a president that likes Xi Jinping or Kim Jong-un or Vladimir Putin better than he likes, you know, Justin Trudeau or Angela Merkel. Uh, I mean, I think it's really pretty outrageous that he prefers all these dictators to democratically elected, you know, leaders. But, you know, there you have it. Uh, you mentioned Vladimir Putin. Uh, you said that uh, he's a father, godfather of populists. Uh, could you explain us what did you mean by this? Well, he, um, he has used his, uh, demo, you know, the fact that he was elected, not freely and fairly, but he was elected and, you know, is popular with a certain part of the Russian population. And he's used that to dismantle uh, the kinds of constitutional protections that this, you know, very young Russian democracy had tried to erect, and he's been very successful at doing that. He, I think, was looking for an ideology, and it was kind of handed to him by people like Orban, you know, who uh, have developed this idea of illiberal democracy, in which you've got, you know, a, a kind of national idea that you uh, then legitimate through elections, but you don't care about all of the constraints on power that a true liberal democracy really employs, and that's what the Russians have done. They've also been very good at doing things like weaponizing the internet, using social media as an as a aggressive weapon to undermine the legitimacy of other democracies. Uh, you say that the world used to be divided on left and right, and today uh, the world is dividing based on identities. Yes. Uh, why do you think that uh, people, uh, that these identity ideas are closer to people uh, rather than, uh, I don't know, those ideas about um, uh, equal chances for everyone? Well, um, it's, it, it's a complicated story. I think that part of the problem is that on the liberal side, people forgot the need that communities and individuals have to feel a sense of solidarity with their fellow citizens. Uh, and there was a sort of sense of global cosmopolitanism that we should worry about, you know, poor people in Africa or Asia just as much as our fellow citizens. And I think this doesn't come naturally to a lot of ordinary voters in, in you know, in um, modern democracies. Uh, that's part of it. And part of it also, I think, is the fact that the left itself reinterpreted what it means to be unequal not in terms of these broad categories like the working class, but the specific 
inequalities suffered by particular groups like immigrants or you know, racial minorities or women or you know, gays and lesbians and so forth. And as a result, there's a sort of disillusion of the idea of a nation. And I think that is one of the things that's upset you know, other voters. And so are we equal people? Well, I think you know, the, the reality of the world is that you have political systems that are committed to a legal and juridical equality of persons. But you know, in fact, people are not equal. Uh, they don't have equal access to power and opportunity. Uh, part of that is natural, that talents are not distributed naturally, but you also have artificial barriers that even in a liberal democracy you're never fully able to overcome. And that, I think, produces this natural resentment that societies are not living up to the promise that they make to their citizens of equality. Uh, pri privatization in unfair conditions. That's uh, how you described uh, privatization in Russia and some other uh, post-Soviet uh, countries. In, in Montenegro uh, as well, there is, uh, it is uh, one of the main objections, unfair conditions and uh, immature uh, institutions. However, uh, life couldn't wait for uh, stronger institutions. Um, therefore, uh, free market in this part of the world was sort of specific. Mm -hmm. uh, from your point of view, uh, what did happen during these uh, 30 years? I think that you can't do something like privatization unless you have a strong state that can oversee the sale of state assets and make sure that they're done fairly and transparently. And I think what happened in the 1990s is that uh, the state authority collapsed in many former communist countries. Obviously in the former Yugoslavia it was the most devastating, but it happened in Russia and Ukraine and other places. And as a result you had the sale of state assets to the insiders who profited from their inside knowledge. And the whole reason you've got so many oligarchs in this part of the world is, I think, precisely because of those failed privatizations. They weren't done fairly. Uh, and they created these huge disparities in wealth that continues to be one of the big problems in this part of the world to the present moment. And did free market really made the institutions stronger? Well, you didn't really have a free market. The thing is that a free market uh, presupposes a strong rule of law where the state is able to um, enforce rules that, that, that force free co truly free competition. And that condition really did not exist. There wasn't a rule of law in, uh, in the former communist world at the moment that you know, the state collapsed and as a result you have a kind of bandit capitalism rather than a truly fair uh, form of competition. Uh, Montenegro is uh, going towards uh, EU membership. Uh, it has been seven years that we have been negotiating. What do you think? Uh, what is EU going to be like when that moment comes? Probably uh, after 2025. Uh, well, you know, obviously the EU, um, because of its current problems in digesting the existing members, uh, is not going to be rushing to expand in a way that it did in you know, previous uh, expansions. So I think that there's going to be much more scrutiny uh, of any new members you know, before they're allowed in. And you know, this part of the world has got a lot of issues um, uh, that you know, have to do with foreign policy, that have to do with corruption, you know, with poor governance and so forth. So I think it's going to be a difficult process to, you know, to continue the accession, but I think it's one that's very important uh, you know, to undertake because the alternative is a Putin-style, you know, crony capitalism, and I think that's not a system that anyone should want to adopt. Um, you, have, you have said several times that uh, Western democracy is in crisis. Well, it is in crisis. We've had a s bunch of setbacks with the rise of populist governments within existing democracies, including in my country, the United States. You have challenges from abroad where China and Russia uh, are authoritarian countries that are very self-confident and projecting power. And so I think you know, we are at an important moment for democracy to see whether the idea survives as a, you know, as a viable and, and expanding one. 
what are the chances of small countries like uh, Montenegro in the EU system, uh, which seems to be protecting uh, uh, interests of the bigger countries? Well, it's always the case that you know the stronger countries are going to dominate that system, but I think that there's not much of an alternative, you know, because um, a small country like Montenegro has to be part of a larger economic unit if it's really going to have the access to markets, you know, that that's needed for prosperity. Uh, and so the question really isn't is the EU a perfect system? The question is what's the alternative and. As I said, you know, the alternative is being absorbed into you know, this Russian orbit where you have much higher levels of corruption and kleptocracy. Uh, China you know, is there as an all, you know, China has actually been playing a useful role in providing capital for infrastructure development, but it's very distant and I think it's not going to help with these governance issues particularly. I think that China is using infrastructure as a way of projecting its own influence uh, and it, unlike the European Union or the United States, doesn't really care that much about the way that countries are governed. They're willing to deal with anybody. Uh, and that, you know, in some respects is good because it does provide alternatives, you know. Um, I don't think the Western world has been doing very much to support, you know, countries that need investment. Uh, on the other hand, it comes at a price because uh, the conditions and the safeguards are really not there as they would be in a, you know, in a Western uh, uh, type of investment. Um, if you were to planify a political strat strategy of a small country like ours, which moves you would suggest? I would continue an accession process. I think that, you know, what the EU demands of new members is what these new members ought to be doing anyhow. They ought to be cleaning up their political systems, getting rid of corruption, improving the capacity of their governments to actually provide services in an impartial way to their citizens, strengthening their legal systems, uh, investing in a you know, more modern economy. So all of these things are desirable, whether you join the European Union or not, and the European Union you know, gives you a big incentive to do that. Uh, so that's something that I would you know, definitely continue. And in your opinion, uh, where is Montenegro now in all of that system? I think Montenegro still has a lot of challenges in terms of its own, you know, its own government. Um, uh, it needs to ensure transparency, um, you know, it needs to meet these European standards and so it's, it's, got, it's got work to do. Okay, we just have to go to commercial for a moment. Uh, reklame pa se, vraćamo na razgovor. Okay, Mr. Fukuyama, uh, 15 years ago, uh, people used to say that you, uh, you had seen further than others. Uh, today, if you are asked uh, uh, how the world is going to be 30 years from now, you usually say you don't know. But hmm. it seems that you are supporting some kind of um, advanced version of liberalism. What does it mean? Uh, I think that pure liberalism has never worked anywhere. Uh, liberalism has to be balanced by a strong state. Uh, it needs to be balanced by a sense that um, the state needs to correct the kinds of inequalities that a market economy uh, produces. And it needs to deal with technology because I think that's really the biggest challenge. Right now you have this prospect that automation and um, artificial intelligence, you know, smart machines are going to displace the livelihoods of a lot of ordinary people. And that is something that socially I don't think any society is going to be able to tolerate. And so you need governments that are able to be flexible to continually adapt to the changes that are being uh, created by technology. The problem is really not capitalism per se. I, you, you can't really have growth and economic prosperity without some form of a market economy. The underlying problem is the technological change that is constantly uh, creating new inequalities, that's creating um, uh, you know, outright dangers in terms of you know, things like nuclear weapons or biotechnology you know, and so forth. And you need a social system that's able to 
you'll never catch up with technology, but you know you can at least uh, try to correct some of the problems that it produces. And that's the sort of liberalism I think that you're going to need for the future. Is that possible in today's world? Well, certainly it's possible. I mean, there's a lot of successful liberal societies, you know, around the world. You look at Canada or Australia or, you know, even, I mean, Germany, I think, has been extremely well governed um, over the past uh, uh, decade, a couple of decades. So, yes, there are some good examples. Are there any alternatives for that? Well, the alternative right now is either an authoritarian one, uh, like China, um, where you have some degree of market economy with a, you know, a dominant single-party state. Uh, that, I don't think, is going to work really anywhere in Europe at the moment. Uh, in Europe, you know, the real alternative is some form of illiberal democracy, where you have a single-party rule that manages to stay in power for very long periods of time, there's a lot of political corruption, you know, the friends and family of the ruler manage to enrich themselves and stay in power, you know, <coughs> on a long-term basis. And that kind of society can persist for, unfortunately, a, you know, a good long period. But it's not the best for its citizens. It doesn't provide equality and it doesn't provide a high level of prosperity. And do you think that Europe uh, has to be changed or something? Well, all societies need to change. You know, if you don't adapt, you, you die. Uh, and I think, you know, there's changes on many fronts. You need to educate people differently. You need to deal with new types of social protections. You need to deal with external challenges. And in all of those respects, I think a lot of the traditional parties had not really been keeping up with what was going on in the broader societies. Mr. Fukuyama, thank you very much for this interview. Thank you very much for talking to me. Poštovani gledalci, pratili ste prva intervju. Ostanite uz prvu televiziju.